All right, guys, welcome back. Um, I'm going to pick up real quick from where we left off, and then we're going to head into a lesson today uh, looking at color, as well as a couple other um, process tips for your final copy. Um, so just a reminder, did my outline in pencil. Before you move on to 3D, sometimes I feel it's helpful to trace it with Sharpie. So I, I've gone ahead and done that. The next thing I should do is use an eraser and just clean up. Um, the lighter you draw, the easier it is to clean up. So it's always a good reminder to draw lightly when you're working with pencil. But I should just go through and kind of clean this up. All right, so now it's cleaned up. It can be helpful to then go back to your pencil. We're going to make it 3D. We make it 3D using a vanishing point, which again, you guys... Um, have seen now and again you can place that vanishing point anywhere that's totally up to you um, I'm gonna put it right up here so you guys can see it pretty clear I don't need to draw all my lines all the way to that vanishing point they can just gesture at it typically I find a trick to do this is I would turn the page towards me um, so that my lines are always drawing in towards myself I find that to be helpful um, but for the purpose of the video Keep it right here. And once I have all these lines, again, it's about tracing and repeating, taking the line you see in the front and trying to repeat that line, and then trying to be consistent on how thick these letters are. Third dimension we're adding to our letters is depth. And remember, it's not connect the dots. This one doesn't connect to that one. So right here I have this moment that the angle of my letter and the angle towards the vanishing point are really similar. So I would either end up with like this really thin 3D that just kind of creeps out right here or no 3D at all. I'm gonna leave that little piece right there. And sometimes I'm gonna have parts like this where I have a line going towards my vanishing point, but I have nothing else to show for that 3D. If the 3D was in here, it would have come down like this and connected to this line somewhere in here. Um, but I don't want my 3D inside the letter. I don't want the 3D to overlap. It just sits behind the word. All right, so I looked it over. 3D looks pretty good. So I'm gonna go ahead and start tracing this out. So you've done your rough sketches. You may have made it 3D by now. And if you have not, uh, I'll go through again in brief how to do that. But if you watch part four in the video series, it will go over in detail how to make your word 3D using one point perspective. Something that I generally tell students before they go on to a final copy is to just make some thumbnail sketches. So if I know I'm writing the word family for my work, and I've done the sketches and I've got the outline done, what I might wanna do is a couple di different ideas of layouts. My outline's done, I don't need to redraw it again. I can just think about placement. If this is my page, what do I want the overall look to be? Do I want the word family right in the middle? Could have been centered a little better. And if so, what goes around it? Um, if I hold my page this way, would family be at the top? Or could family be at the bottom? Totally up to me, just placement on the page. Most commonly, right in the center is generally what you see. It puts the emphasis on the word. That's what graffiti is about, is writing a word. 
Um, but you could do it anywhere if you want more space for background and kind of decorating, it's totally up to you. Um, and as far as what the background is, could just be um, patterns, designs. You know, I might say I'm gonna have a little cloud around it as a common uh, motif in graffiti. And put some little bubbles. And maybe the background behind that is striped. Doesn't have to be perfect. It's just illustrating the idea. So I have thought through what I'm gonna do. It helps me know where to place my word uh, for my final copy. If you feel like you've, you're too far ahead to do this, keep in mind you can always trace. Um, you can take your a rough draft or one that you've already developed, trace it onto a new sheet of paper, place it where you want it, develop a background around it. Just color drips. And I could try adding color to it if I wanted to just to see you know, what that might look like. You could also do something that's a little bit more of some sort of picture or scene, you know, maybe maybe I have my like, house or something. So I have the word family at the bottom, the picture of the house with the trees or whatever around it. Composition, the layout and where you place things is up to you, as well as the content. What do you want the background to be? Again, just designs, patterns, fades of color, that stuff's fine. Uh, if you want to be more elaborate with it, you can. Kind of common in the world of graffiti, and I know some of my students are interested in cartooning and anime, is like playing with characters. Um, so sometimes people might have, you know, their word here, uh, and then somehow, kind of floating around it, they kind of work in their character design, you know, maybe hovering over it, or... Um, characters like hanging out over here, but just like kind of putting them within the scene. Very common in the world of graffiti is also um, other lettering. Uh, graffiti is about writing a name. People have some sort of tag name or nickname and they write that word over and over and over, but they often also have other things they want to write, whether it's uh, a crew name to, to the team of artists that they kind of work with or the names of other graffiti writers that they like to shout out to. Um, if you wanted to add other text to it, you can, and sometimes that text is usually just small writing. So the emphasis is still on family. So you're just kind of splashing around little writing. But having a composition, a little thumbnail sketch of a composition can be helpful. examples to show you just a variety of different ideas and I'll use the fuller outline to apply some of it. I find the first area to focus on when you're coloring is your 3D. However, before you jump into just starting to color, say oh, I want the 3D purple, I'm just going to choose purple, it can be really helpful to look through your colors and figure out what you like. Before I just start coloring, I'm kind of picking out some colors looking at what colors I have and what I think looks good together. So I sometimes find that just like looking at it, in this case I can look at the caps and the markers, place them together, ask myself if I like the way it looks. You're gonna want at least one color that's a high contrast color, and I'll get into that in a minute. So as I looked at my colors, I kind of liked the idea of doing something that was maybe greens and purples together and then I kept some blues around as well that I might use um, sometimes easier to do that with colored pencils um, just easier to kind of look at them in your hand compare colors and say okay if this is what I end up using in the word and I need to pick something else to go with this what looks good and so that you can take out a color kind of compare it and say do I like the way that yellow sits with the greens and the purples uh, or do I like the way that 
where the oranges sit, I like the way a pink sits, so on, and see if I can find something um, that I like that goes with it. So as we get to coloring, I find it's great to start with the 3D. Because some of these end up very complex, if you're a little confused when you're looking at your artwork, it can be helpful to go through with a pencil and just very lightly kind of mark, like, well, what's my 3D, what's the letter? This one I think is pretty clear to see. Uh, a more complex outline, it might be tough for you to understand. And you just want to make sure that you don't color in the wrong thing, that you don't end up coloring your 3D color inside the letter. You definitely want a different set of colors for your 3D than you do for the inside of your letters, which is called your fill-in. So we're gonna start with 3D. And in this case, I'm gonna use purple. And I'm gonna show you a couple different ideas. And you guys can do what you want on your own. I'm just gonna show you a couple trends that happen, as well as, as the one rule that should go with this which is whatever you do for your 3D, they're all the same. This doesn't always have to be the case, but if you spend some time looking at a lot of graffiti, you're gonna see that that's pretty common amongst um, the graffiti you will look at. So a couple things that come up often. Uh, one of them is using stripes or a gradient, and I'll show you both. So a lot of times people will do some sort of striping for theirs, um, and the stripe typically accents the perspective that you used. My vanishing point was way off in the distance this way. Um, so I might put some stripes on it that kind of go with that. It doesn't take a lot of them. And I would go through and make sure that if I did that for one of the parts of 3D, I use the same idea for all of them. And those stripes really accent this uh, movement from the vanishing point. Now, it's a really good one with markers. In process, I laid down my lighter color first and I could put my darker color right over it. You can do the same thing with colored pencils. If that's what you have to work with. Uh, I'll show you a nice variation of something you can do with colored pencils that is much more difficult with markers. Now note, I know I say all the same. My example, I'm gonna show you a bunch of different things here, and then I'll pick one of them to use for my actual copy. So another idea would be a value scale. So as I create a value scale, which goes from dark to light, or shades to tints of a color, dark to light, and again, we typically call dark shades, uh, and light is a tint. And as I want to move along this, my fade's going to go in this direction. I find it's easy to make it work with my pencil stroke going perpendicular to this. So my pencil's going to go this way. And so as I go here, I start darker and fade it over. The motion of my pencil doesn't change. The only thing that changes is the pressure that I'm applying. And so as I apply, apply less pressure, it fades, and it fades, and it fades. You can do a lot with this technique, whether it's in your 3D or inside your letters. Um, I'm gonna use it a couple different ways. Uh, sometimes a fun way to do it is, you know, have it fade from one end and the other, or fade from one color to another color. Some nice techniques you can do with that. Inside the letter here, I'm gonna do this idea of fading it up to white, and then I'll start it at the other end, fade it down. It's a technique that might take you a little bit of practice. You can always go to a rough draft. Try adding color to the rough draft first before you add color to your final copy. It's a good way to think through some of your decisions as well as practice some of the techniques that you need to use. And you can see here as I'm doing this, as they're all starting to be the same, it really starts to help, help gel the whole thing together. One of the concepts that I've said a bunch uh, through the prior videos is be consistent. And ultimately, all this consistency give the artwork the concept of unity, that it really bonds everything together. 
the styles bonding it together, and now our fill-in and our colors are gonna help gel it all together as well. So now we have this 3D. I could leave it like that. I could play around with it some more. Sometimes, you know, you could do this and then put stripes through it. And again, if I did that to one of them, I should probably go through and add that same design. Again, these aren't the only techniques you could use. If you have some markers and some colored pencils at home, you can combine these things, right? I could take a foundation of this marker and then I could take the colored pencil and add some fading over it. Same technique. Now when it fades out, it's just gonna fade into that purple that's lying underneath. So I can layer these two together, work them together if I want to. A couple other nice techniques that can work really well. Framing. I could take this section and add a frame to it. I'm gonna do an oval frame. And again, if you did it to all of them, it can look really good. You could do something with uh, a set of stripes going towards your vanishing point. Doing the opposite, I could take these spaces here and I could divide these up the other way. Take this and divide that 3D in half. Again, these are just some ideas. I split this one here. Uh, in half, stripes, value scales on top of another color. Um, this had the value scale with the stripe in it, and then I put a frame around it. Um, the framing one could be blocky as well, instead of doing rounded. It's totally up to you what you want to use for your 3D. It doesn't have to be one of the techniques I showed here. You know, if you want to just find some other pattern, your checkerboard or polka dots or um, anything, it's totally up to you. However, I would just emphasize again, whatever you do for your 3D, it's all the same. So now we're gonna get into the next area, the inside of the letters, uh, which is called your fill or your fill in. Literally, how do you fill in the letters? Um, Again, similar to 3D, it's, it's really up to you as an individual, whatever you want to do, but there are some common trends that we see if you spend some time looking at a lot of graffiti. Within the fill-in, generally, you don't necessarily want it to match your 3D color. So I don't want to use these same shades of purple in here because this could get a little bit lost if I do. In my case, I did choose some greens to work with, um, so I'll play with a couple different green ideas. So again, it's really up to you what you do, but two common things that we see are thinking about the entire word as one object. That I'm not gonna color in like just the letter A one thing and then the letter B is something else and the letter C is something else and so on, but rather this is one object and whatever I do, it treats the entire object the same. And so I'm gonna play around with some horizontal, we can call banding, just lines that come across. And I could do this just as a straight line. And again, it goes right through that A, right across into that letter. Um, and then I could go to the next color, do the same thing and so on. So that this comes right across. One green, a different green in the middle, a different shade at the bottom. However, those lines don't have to be straight. I could be creative with them. So I could say like, this one's gonna be a drip coming down and I could fill in the whole top with that design. You can start to see how that fill-in going across the letters, again, helps gel the whole object together. It's becoming one solid thing instead of broken up or fragmented into different letters. You're treating the word as, as a whole. Uh, and that idea creates unity. A couple little tricks that can be helpful, again, similar to how I laid the colored pencil over the marker here. 
um, I can use the darker marker to go over the lighter marker. So, you know, this green in the middle can very easily come up on top of this. I have some bubbles dripping up off of this. Um, sometimes lines that like help accent the letter. So that horizontal banding of color and then working some designs into it can be a nice way to do this. Where your designs are inspired from is totally up to you. Uh, so a couple other ideas here. Just like this faded across, it doesn't have to be across. It could be like diagonal. I could go from lighter to darker. Uh, I could go from lighter on one part of a letter, darker in the center, and come back to lighter down here. Um, totally up to you. And you don't have to use that technique at all. You could just do more solids. Um, you know, it can be helpful to look at a lot of graffiti and kind of see what different ideas people use and see what you like. And with colored pencils, using gradients or value scales is a little easier. I'm going to go right on top of the marker. And sometimes, if you feel like you can see the pencil stroke of your color pencil too much, you could always take your finger or like a twisted up paper towel um, or tissue and kind of soften that out. Um, some of you may have seen something like this before. It's a, a blending stump. And they just kind of smooth things out. So I got my fill in, I got my 3D. The whole objects are kind of gelling together probably finish this 3D a little bit, even if they're not all the same, just for the look. So the next thing I'm going to go over is what's called an outer glow. Often in the world of graffiti, it might be called a force or a border. I learned it as the term force, and someone at the time described it to me as, it's like a force field. Think of this object having a glowing force field around it. Um, in the world of graphic design, it might be referred to as an outer glow. It's an, a glow off of the outside of the object. Uh, and graffiti artists use this technique all the time. And one of the reasons is that line helps uh, isolate the object and advance it forward. It separates the object from the background and makes it pop or stand out. Graphic designers love it because it makes their logo stand out or the name of a team or, or a product they're trying to sell. You want that to be something that, again, will help it stand out. So I don't necessarily want to work in the greens or purples. I need something different than that. Something bright and bold could help this out. A um, couple neat choices can be using a highlighter. Uh, if there's a highlighter color that you think sits okay with it, um, for the purpose of this demo, I'm going to use a paint marker, and so I can take this line. What's nice about a paint marker is a paint marker will go over the black outline. Um, it can be a nice marker to work with if you wanted to add something on top of a color. In this case, I don't want it to go over that black, although right here I do. That's a kind of terrible line right there. Typically, your force or border stays tight to the letter like that. It might have some effects coming off of it. Um, you know, maybe a couple little drips hanging off of it, uh, or little bubbles. Um, but it doesn't have to have much. A couple other fun ways that people use it are to layer it, to do like two colors next to each other. And again, if I had a paint marker right here, I could clean that up, whereas the Sharpie won't let me. It won't draw over it. But the paint marker, I'll start to level that out a little bit. If I let that dry, I can put another coat on there. Some people might play around with how they 
layer together. You know, maybe there's a, a yellow and a orange. So two lines around it if you want to. You certainly don't have to do that. It's just an idea. Or again, if you're using colored pencils, um, you might be able to take this idea and instead of having it just be solid, like maybe it kind of fades off somehow. But you can imagine this being darker, fading off this way. Or with a paint marker, a couple things I could do is I could purposely smudge it. Use my hand, kind of pull that away from it. And if any of you do have paint markers at home, a nice little technique with a paint marker is you can press the tip in and flood the marker, put a little ink on that marker, and then you can make it splatter. Uh, a couple fun ways to do that, I might take a scrap piece of paper, use it to mask or block, and blow through the marker, put a little splatter there, and burst some splatters around it. And sometimes I might just use my hand. All right, a couple different ideas for your outer glow or force. And so the last one I'm gonna show, um, in the world of graphic design, again, it might be called an inner glow. Sometimes graffiti writers might call this a highlight. It's usually a line that accents the inside trim of the letter. Now you'll be a little bit limited on what you can do with this, uh, depending upon the tools you have. At this point, because they're colored in, my option here really is a paint marker, or I could try a white or silver colored pencil. Sometimes a metallic colored pencil will show up over these. Otherwise, you would plan this in ahead of time. You might start by adding this design in and then um, color your fill in around it. So I'm gonna use this white paint marker here. And I'm gonna accent the inside trim of the letters. And now I could go around the entire letter. In this case, I'm gonna just go over the lines that are facing the right side of the letter. So I'm gonna go this one because it's facing the right. So I'm only accenting lines on the right side. Here, here, this would be the right side. This one, all this stuff up the right side of the letter A. And here, here. And like the metallic Sharpie, because it's a little easier to control, it's a finer line. Um, and it's still a paint marker, so it will cover over some of the black. And for the purpose of demonstration, I'm gonna go around the whole letter here, just so you can see the difference. It does have a little different feel for it. Um, you don't have to use an inner glow or highlight at all if you don't want to. I might draw a circle here and just put some cutting lines through it. And I can draw a little glare spot. I don't know how that's showing up on film. Circle center. You can do them like that. Um, they could just be diamonds. Either way can work. And they don't have to be big if you don't want them to be. Your 3D should all be the same. Your fill-in should think about the whole word, not individual letters. Your outer glow or force helps separate it from the background and advance it forward. It should be a high contrast color. It should help it pop. And if you want to have highlights, um, your highlights can trim out and accent the inside form of the letter. Sometimes you have to think through adding that highlight first, uh, especially if you don't have a paint marker or if you want to leave it white, you kind of leave it white um, and work around it. So let's apply it, let's see how it looks.
some of you might have the supplies at home to do. You can do this with a regular pencil. Um, you could do this with a, I could use a shade of a colored pencil. Um, what I'm gonna try to do here is create some drop shadows, some cast shadows from one letter to another. Um, so I'm gonna look at this, this letter right here. This letter M form comes over the letter Y right here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a little shadow underneath this letter to kind of advance it forward. One little trick I like to use to do this is I can take my, uh, I'm using a, um, a darker drawing pencil, a 4B pencil, which is a, a little deeper and softer graphite. Um, and I'm just gonna take that and I'm gonna scribble some onto a piece of paper like this. And then I'm gonna use my blending stump. And I'm just gonna press a blending stump on it. You, again, you could use your finger or colored pencil you could use a twisted up piece of paper. And I'm gonna grab some of this. It works really well with a blending stump because I can control this as a drawing tool. And I'm just gonna take this, and I'm gonna draw right underneath that. I'm gonna kind of mimic that shape a little bit. And it's just gonna make that letter cast a shadow down onto the next one. So again, take some of this, pick it up on the blending stump. That one there. That cast shadow makes this letter Y really advance forward or up above the object that's below it. And I'm imagining the light is coming in from the top left, so the shadows are gonna drop down to the right. Shadows down into the right, the shadows down into the right. Anytime I want an object to float, I can do that. What's nice about this technique is if you don't like it, if you try it, and again, you could just use a regular pencil and just try to lightly draw it in. Um, if I want this one here, I could try to lightly just shade a little pencil here. If I don't have a blending stump, I could just maybe take my finger and kind of soften it out. And just put a little shadow there. Again, I like to use this technique with the blending stump. But if you don't like it, or you feel like you do it and it, and it was wrong or doesn't look correct, it's very easy. You just take an eraser and just clean it out. You're not committing to anything. You know, this one, let's say I go like too big with that one. It's not a problem at all. You just take my eraser. It's just pencil, and I can kind of cut that back. Give that a little shape. It's really easy to drop in those shadows that way. I find that this technique, coupled with some highlights, can really help make the surface of your word look pretty interesting. All right, so let's finish up with some highlights.